Good evening. Um, our speaker tonight is Tessa Lewinsky Desmond. Uh, Dr. Des uh, Lewinsky Desmond is a lecturer and associate research scholar in American studies at the university. I don't have to say which university, right? Um, she works, uh, focuses on food politics, the history of farming in the 20th century uh, here in America, racial justice, migrant farm labor, and multi-ethnic literature. She got her doctorate at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She subsequently served as administrative director and lecturer for the Committee on Ethnicity, Migration, and Rights at Harvard University. And then uh, in Madison and Cambridge, she was very active in community agricultural pro uh, projects. And she and her husband came, came to Princeton in 2017. Um, and she is the real deal because she's a real farmer. And uh, she, uh, her family live on their farm, Firefly Homestead Farm in Hopewell. And uh, I have to read this. Uh, she has a flock of laying hens, a goose, and you can correct me if I've got the census wrong, cows, goats, a donkey, and they raise pigs and chickens for meat, and have a large garden and are planting fruit and nut trees. So uh, that's an exciting thing in the neighborhood. Uh, the title of her talk is Bringing Home Here, Seed Saving and Immigrant Foodways in the United States. And she'll talk about some of the people and plants that traversed the globe and came to take root here in America. Please help me welcome her. Let's get this to my height. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Pamela Hughes and Meredith Lazier and Abigail Sheehan and Dario Maestro Iani. All everybody made um, getting here and planning, even on a blustery day, really easy. And I'm honored to be invited. And I thank you all for traversing out to have a conversation um, that I'm particularly excited about. Um, the lecture. Um, as I was prepping for it, took on a life of its own. And what ended up happening is I ended up reading very familiar history through a new lens. And so we're going to go back to the Columbian Exchange, and we're going to go to colonial explorers and early settlers and, um, the, and two major waves of immigration. We're going to just kind of do a major bird's eye view, but we're going to think about it through the realm of how it shaped our contemporary foodscape in the United States. Um, and so I hope that you're along for the ride, and I look forward to the conversation that we're going to get to have. Um, so um, our edible landscape, as we all know, is marked by diversity and choice right now. Grocery stores commonly carry 40 to 60,000 products on the shelves, which is an exponential increase over the 7,000 products that were commonly stocked just two decades ago. If you live in a mid-sized town or city like Princeton, we have access to many restaurants to choose from, some of which represent foods that are very different from whatever we were raised eating. Our current foodscape um, uh, is a relatively recent phenomenon. After all, the first supermarket, which was a Piggly Wiggly, was opened in 1916, just a little over 100 years ago. And restaurants were coming into fashion only decades earlier. <coughs> Our food system is a kind of marvel, a wonder. Its value, efficiency, choice, frugality, and uniformity, um, it values those things. And on those axes, it outperforms all others. Now, usually my talks focus on all the caveats and cautions that I have about the values and practices of our current food system. But tonight, though, I want to dig deeper into how we got here. I want to go back to the Columbian Exchange, the colonial era, and snapshots of the agricultural and plant exploration of a new nation. And I want to examine the massive explosion of agricultural variety that we've experienced. I want to consider how the coveting and collection of those varieties mapped on to patterns of exploration and colonialism, which in themselves had a kind of diversity. 
We'll look at how national and ethnic diversity began shaping the contours of our food culture for those, earlier day, those earliest days. And then we'll come back to our present moment and discuss current issues in plant diversification and consumption. Part of the invigorating and challenging um, work that I get to do in food studies is that it's really interdisciplinary. And so while I was trained in literary studies, I now engage with history and anthropology, sociology, biology, agricultural sciences, journalism, architecture, and nutrition. I, I go anywhere that the questions take me. And so in fact, much of the work of the field that I'm in has to do with putting thinkers and practitioners into conversation to puzzle out the significance of and the stories around food. So in this talk, in particular, I'm going to be putting together history and anthropology and sociology and drawing generously from the work of historians Donna Gabaccia, Kenneth Kippel, rural sociologist Jack Kloppenberg, anthropologists including Alfred Crosby and Virginia Nazaria, and using a classic text from um, Nelson Close called America's Crop Heritage. But before we get into that, I, as a scholar of literature, I usually start thinking about questions by ferreting out literary examples of whatever social phenomenon I'd like to know more about. And then I turn those instances over in my mind and wonder about the character's experience and what shaped the character up to that moment. And I use literature to sort of puzzle over the problem as a way in, and I'd like to do that today. And so uh, where I want to actually start is with the main character of a Jhumpa Lahiri story, The Third and Final Continent. So the main character of the story, who has no name, moves from Bengal to London to Boston in the span of the story. In London, he rooms with other young Bengali bachelors. Egg curry is what they eat. And that comes to symbolize the cooking incompetence of he and his flatmates. Now, there's a leading food studies scholar named Krishendu Ray, who also hails from India, and has shared his own experience of how immigration shaped his relationship with cooking. And Ray writes about that, quote, I had never cooked a meal when I came to the United States in 1988. I had made omelets, taught by a Boy Scouts camp counselor in Jamshapur. I had brewed tea a handful of times, and that's it. That kind of experience with cooking is not an expectation. In fact, a study shows Indian men coming pretty close to last in global terms of sharing domestic caregiving work. This is his words. <laughs> Now I cook often, write about food, and teach it. That was a transformation wrought not by a conscientious thinking and virtuous, virtuous subject, but by the force of circumstance and the absence of servants and women. Ray now not only cooks and writes, but he also chairs the food studies um, uh, program at NYU. And before that, he worked at the Culinary Institute of America. So if we can imagine Lahiri's narrator as Ray himself, never having cooked a meal um, in his life before leaving Bengal, then we might understand why her character's first trip to an American grocery store nets him a spoon, a dish, a box of cornflakes, and a carton of milk. Ingredients which come to make up his dinner each and every night, which eventually was diversified with bananas. Having no access to a fridge, the kid keeps his milk on the shady, or the kid, the narrator keeps his milk on the shady part of his windowsill. And in the story, the cornflakes become a metaphor for the narrator's early experiences in Boston. They're bland, processed, not particularly nourishing. Bananas, a tropical fruit, transported across the globe, much like the narrator himself, are culinary diversity. In the story, though, this changes when his wife arrives. Theirs was an arranged marriage. She comes a stranger. Her first morning in the States, she prepares rice for his breakfast, as would befit most men um, uh, from their home country. He tells her, cornflakes will do next time. And the next morning, she has a bowl of cornflakes poured. Not long after, she asks for money and then buys a potato peeler and ingredients for chicken curry with fresh ginger and garlic. And the narrator and his wife grow together over the course of the story. As it closes, the narrator tells us that they have a son for whom his wife Mala, quote, occasionally weeps. So we drive to Cambridge to visit him or bring him home for the weekend 
so that he can eat rice with us with his hands and speak in Bengali, things we sometimes worry he will no longer do after we die, end quote. In this story, the narrator arrives in a new land without skill to cook or cultivate his own food. He adopts food ways that are foreign to him, but common to those around him. And he adapts to such a degree that when offered more culturally familiar fare, he refuses it in favor of the cornflakes. Yet over time, he circles back to the traditions of the table from his home culture, like eating rice with his hands. The arc of the story that I want to tell you today is not so different from the story of Lahiri's narrator. The story I want to tell is about how settlers to North America arrived with some of the easiest foods from home they could carry, like the narrator's egg curry, and then had to survey the new landscape, adapt to what was available here, but then generally accumulated skill and resources to take what was here and make it more familiar to such, to, to such a degree that they could replicate culinary practices that, yes, were still hybrid, but much more closely approximated the food of their origins. The story that I want to tell, though, didn't happen in a single lifetime. It happened over generations, which makes it, to me, a little even more compelling and interesting. Food historian Donna Gabaccia tells us that, quote, food and language are cultural traits humans learn first and the ones that they change with the greatest reluctance. Humans cannot easily lose their accents when they new no learn a new language after about the age of 12. And similarly, the food that they eat as children forever defines familiarity and comfort. The way that food comes to define familiarity and comfort, though, is not immutable. In fact, Sherry Innes, a literary scholar, argues that, quote, we can never recreate the foods from our childhoods like childhood itself, they remain forever just outside our grasp. Outside of our grasp, yes, but still present. So think about your own comfort food. Mine is something that my mom made. I can see it and taste it and smell it when I think about it. It was a lasagna like no other lasagna you've probably ever eaten. Is tonight's chef in the room? I hope not. Um, the lasagna was actually made with Velveeta cheese, <laughs> a staple in my home. <laughs> and that was comfort food. That was comfort food that I requested on every birthday of my childhood. Um, and it stays in my head. Um, my mother has since passed away. And if I tried to make it now, um, what would come out of my kitchen would be an abominable approximation. Yet all lasagnas none of which have Velveeta cheese in them, um, make me think about my mom's lasagna. I can't imagine that I'll ever eat it, that childhood lasagna again, yet it stays with me. And so those are kind of the images that I want us to be thinking about, images that are resonant from our current moment or our current lives, but we can take those images and we can think about history through them, especially the history of food, which I think connects us with people across cultures in our own moment, but I think can connect us across history as well. So part of the question that I was asking in preparation for this talk was really about the relationship between durable ties to food and new landscapes. And what do people do when they're faced with a new landscape where the food from their childhood or the foods that are most important to them are no longer available? One answer, which I'll get to at the very end of the talk, is that they save seeds and they grow them in the new land. But what I learned through my research is actually about the ways that entire groups of people over the last several hundred years have been practicing to some, have been participating to some extent in the process of both bringing home here and adapting to new ideas of home here. Originally, I wanted to tell you a neat, simple story about foods that immigrants brought here on boats and planes and planted in gardens, which then took root and spread. I thought I'd talk about broccoli and its origins among Italian immigrants tomatillos and jalapenos and serranos grown among immigrants from Mexico, hot peppers from India, lemongrass from Southeast Asia. And on the surface, those stories hold some truth. But it's also more complicated than that. Take those peppers that I was going to use to chart a path from India to the United States. It turns out that those chili peppers originated in Central America and then were carried to Europe and elsewhere in the Colombian Exchange. 
Europeans didn't take to them, but people in Africa and in India, China, Korea, and Southeast Asia did. And how? Kenneth Kippel tells us that, quote, they were accepted as enthusiastically as Turkey in Europe, even reaching to the peaks of the Himalayas, an odd place for a tropical fruit, but making the point that chili peppers can be grown practically anywhere. Kippel goes on, their worldwide dispersal was largely the work of the Portuguese. The New World capiscums spread like wildfire in the East Indies and along African coasts so quickly, in fact, that within a generation or two, everybody, including the Europeans, were convinced that chili peppers were native to India and the Orient, save for the Africans who claimed them as their own native plants. So in fact, chili peppers are foods that migrated from Mexico to India in the 1500s and then made their way back into fashion in North America when people arrived here from Africa and India, creating new communities of consumption hungry for them. So the story of bringing home here is not linear at all, in fact. The globalization of food has been happening for a very long time, hastened by ambitious explorers and inventors, as well as unknowing accomplices and intentional immigrants. But because we might start somewhere or else we might not get anywhere, let me start with the new world. So the botanical landscape of North America, and particularly the agricultural botanical landscape, has been, uh, has been shaped since the discovery of the new world. In fact, the phenomenon I'm talking about isn't unique to North America at all. New research has found that nearly two-thirds of the globe's most productive agricultural crops originated in places other than where they're growing today. In the words of the lead researcher of this new study, Colin Khoury, quote, our entire food system is completely global. And I would add, our entire food system is completely immigrant in nature. Nikolai Vavilov is a Russian plant explorer um, uh, uh, from the 1920s, and he began what has since become systematic inquiry into crop origins. From his work and the um, work of researchers following him, like Khoury, we now know that um, the world's most productive agricultural crops, among those, only seven originated in North America. Blueberries, cranberries, Grapes, pumpkins and gourds, raspberries, strawberries, and sunflowers. Now, I enjoy fruit as much as the next person, but very little of my daily dietary intake comes from those plants. Um, diet in North America, as we all know, instead depends chiefly on crops like wheat and barley, chickpeas, soybeans, um, maize, and all of those originated in the Mediterranean, Asia, and Mexico. So while all of the world's food supply is now global in scope, it wasn't always so. Jack Kloppenberg and Daniel Kleinman, both sociologists, elucidate this clearly for us. They write, quote, the vagaries of natural history have resulted in an uneven distribution of plant species over the face of the globe. The Northern Hemisphere lost much under the grinding impact of glaciation. Consequently, biotic diversity is concentrated in now what is the third world, Moreover, it is in the third world that the, domestic the domestication of plants first occurred and systematic crop production was first initiated. Kloppenberg and Kleinman go on to conceptualize the global landscape of plant genetic diversity. They identify gene poor areas of the world, namely North America, Europe, and Australia, and gene rich areas of the world, largely in the equatorial zone. So due to the paucity of plant genetic diversity relative to other areas of the world in what was um, it made it all the more important for North American early settlers and later in infant nation to invest attention and resources into trading seeds and plants. Kloppenberg argues that, in fact, quote, the introduction of plants into America has been much more than a great service. It has been an absolute imperative a biological sine qua non upon which rests the whole complex edifice of American industrial society. The landscape of North America in 1500 was not capable of supporting large numbers of immigrants. Many, settler, many settlements failed in no small part because of food and starvation. Native Americans were mostly distributed across the landmass. Pueblos and Iroquois were able to cultivate maize on a large scale and therefore had larger and more permanent settlements. But for the most part, other tribes engaged in some agriculture 
or primarily hunted and gathered, but they did a mix of both. The land and the population were more or less in balance when settlers arrived from England, Spain, France, and elsewhere. So in a way, there was a bit of a BYOB requirement in the New World. <laughs> North America, as we know it today, is indebted to the exchange of plant materials that began in earnest with the Columbian Exchange. In fact, on Columbus's second voyage, he landed in Hispaniola with livestock and the seeds of many Spanish crops, as well as sugarcane from the Canaries. Other Spanish explorers, too, brought figs, dates, grapes, olives, and pomegranates, crops whose intentional cultivation in North America dates to Spanish missions in New, York, in New Mexico and California. Those varieties are successful in that climate, but many experiments along those lines failed. You'll all recall that after Columbus sailed to the Caribbean and beyond, there began a time of great exploration. It was really in the 1520s and the 1530s when much of the land that's now the U.S. was charted. Really from 1513 to 1542, the likes of De Leon and Alvarado, Gomez, De Soto, Coronado, Cabrillo, these are all names that we learned in elementary uh, history, right? Um, they were making tracks and, uh, uh, around and across our territory, the territory that is now the United States. Exploring, though, proved perhaps a bit easier than settling. Though I admit I wasn't there, and maybe it was a to each his own thing. Um, the later 1500s saw increased attempts at settlements, especially in Florida and South Carolina, or South, yeah, South Carolina, but also in the Chesapeake Bay and Roanoke Island, many of which failed. When the earliest settlers arrived, they were more or less on their own. There were not trade routes yet for all the places that people had landed. They could count on some supplies from home but also very much needed to forage and make a way for themselves in the New World. When the English arrived in Virginia, the Native Americans they encountered were accustomed to agriculture. They grew corn and squash and beans known as Three Sisters, which provided much of their nutrition. Supplements to their basic diet included turkey, fish, and shellfish, roots and berries, among other things. To the English settlers, corn and squash were altogether new. They had never seen them. Beans, though different varietals, were grown in Europe and so somewhat familiar. But the English settlers arrived with seeds in the hopes of self-sufficiency. The seeds they brought, in the, world, in the words of William Bradshaw, though, quote, came not to good. And during the winter of 1609 to 1610, two-thirds of the colony died in what was termed the, starva the starving time. Though native crops were, quote, not necessarily to their taste, the early settlers enlisted the help and sought opportunities to trade. For instance, in the Plymouth Colony in 1621, the governor requested to trade. And in the spring of that year, colonists planted 20 acres of maize and five acres of English grains. And colonist Edward Winslow wrote, quote, we had a good increase of Indian corn. Our barley, indifferent good. Our peace, not worth harvesting. Indeed, because of their land tenure before the colonists, Native Americans had adapted and collected many varieties of maize that performed differently depending on climate and location. And so began a search for variety and vigor that would both satiate and sustain the growing population of arriving immigrants. In fact, the diverse character of our national, of our national foodscape still owes much to the colonial era. English colonists, diverse in their own right, were searching for something that was different from that of the French and Spanish colonists. In his book, Ecological Imperialism, anthropologist Alfred Crosby argues that Europe's colonial successes are in no small part due to biological and specifically ecological factors. He observes that the Neo-Europes, which is the term that he gives them, are completely or at least two-thirds in the temperate zones, north and south, which is to say that they have roughly the same climates. And Donna Gabaccio expands on this observation, saying that in most, European, um, in most cases, Europeans settled in regions not totally unlike their home country, at least in terms of land and climate. So in France and England, there were lands of forests with changing seasons and climate that supported permanent agriculture. That's very much akin to the eastern seaboard, and, and um, so the New World in some ways was familiar in landscape. The Spanish um, in the north of Mexico encountered drier, warmer, treeless environment, more familiar to them than it would have been to folks from northern France or to su or southern England. 
And so, quote, while this rough match of settlers and environment was not enough to eliminate all the challenges of settlement, it did ease European adjustments, facilitating the introduction and cultivation of familiar foods. The New World would come to, in fact, serve as what Crosby called Europe's first offshore farm, supplying production power in both newly discovered foods, such as pumpkins and turkeys, but also in more familiar staples needed to feed a growing population. And you'll recall that at this time, the population in, in, in England in particular is exploding in preparation for what then becomes um, the Industrial Revolution there. The staples that would come to support the exponentially increasing population of North America included corn, wheat, rice, cotton, and sugar, too, became important. Corn had been cultivated by Native Americans, and settlers were able to kind of um, uh, learn and adopt practices from them. But they needed to figure it out on their own for some of these other staples. The cotton gin, of course, in 1793 made cotton increasingly productive. Um, sugar became commercially viable in 1794 because we got a good cultivator for Louisiana. Rice became profitable at the turn of the century. And during the 19th century, we still imported a fair bit of wheat. Um, but many farmers across the country were growing a lot of varieties. Slaves from Africa, too, were brought quite, quite close to the time um, that the settlers arrived. Indeed, in 1619, Dutch traders brought 19 Africans to Jamestown, having seized them from a Spanish slave ship. It wasn't until the middle of the 1700s that Africans were brought over as slaves by the tens of thousands, but even so, their presence shaped the foodscape and shaped the foodscape that um, settlers and colonists were trying to create. Um, because the question was, what will they eat? Um, so, although it wasn't likely intentional, the Colombian exchange was already paving the way for some semblance of dietary continuity. Corn, cassava, peppers, sweet potatoes, pineapples, and peanuts were all from the Americas, but they had made their way to West Africa, where they were being cultivated by the 1700s. Those plants, for the most part, also did well in warmer climates, which is, of course, uh, the case um, for our warmer area of the country, the South. Um, and it was thought that African slaves in particular would perform work better in the warmer climate, so they were settled there in the New World because it best matched, uh, best approximated their climate and landscape um, from Africa. So this, because um, the Columbia Exchange had already greased the wheels of this trade of familiar foods, had made foods from Central America familiar in West Africa, and then facilitated the coming of those foods to, to our southern areas. Um, this facilitated the ability of newly arriving slaves to self-provision, which in turn laid the foundation for some of the food that we know today as southern. So throughout the 1700s, the earliest immigrants to what is now the United States were from Africa, Great Britain, including Scotch, Irish, and English, and Germany. And as settlements expanded west, slowly many Germans moved in that direction, eventually settling in the upper Midwest. Um, African slaves were, of course, in the large part held in the southeastern states. And in the 1800s, as, um, as, uh, as territorial acquisition occurred, um, it made westward expansion happen, and not only more possible, but even providential. And it's at that time that we really see settlers begin to build culinary traditions. Those are culinary traditions that are being built on the contours of colonial practice, but they're, um, uh, they're relying on sort of the roots of Spanish, French, English, and Dutch origins um, that all come to bear in distinct ways. Um, so Kenneth Kippel's work for the next section of this paper is particularly important. Um, he has written uh, the Cambridge, he's edited the Cambridge World History of Food, which uh, are two very heavy volumes um, that kind of cover a lot of this stuff. But then he has also written a much appreciated, thinner, but still ambitious book that distills those several thousand pages down into just a few hundred called Ten Millennia of Food of, of food globalization. <laughs> um, and so a lot, of the, a lot of this next section of the paper comes from his work, which is, of course, kind of monumental and massive. So Creole, the word, comes from the Spanish criollo, which was used to mean born in America. And the name is apt for the cuisine it comes to signify. Creole, the food, that spicy seafood-based fare best known throughout Louisiana, comes from a blending of French and African food traditions. But it's more complex than that. Before Louisiana was a territory of the US, it was a place where French and Spanish colonists mingled. 
and after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, German farmers settled there upon the promise of free land and helped to found agriculture in that area. After the French Revolution, refugees from France arrived, as did slaves from San Domingue, where a slave revolt had pushed out whites, some of whom relocated to Louisiana with their slaves to continue their, their agricultural practices that relied on slave labor, and some of them with freedmen. Creole foodways um, have a rural counterpart, of course, known as Cajun, and the two share much except the, the location of where they're cooked. Um, and Kenneth Kipple argues that both Creole and Cajun are in large part indebted to a blending of French and African influences that started melding in Haiti and continue to do so in a particularly American way in Louisiana. He summarizes accordingly. Creole had an American birth even if the midwives were foreign. Haitian cookery was influenced with Asian rice brought to Louisiana in 1718 by the British. Chicory from Southern Europe, American plants such as tomatoes, potatoes, red beans, squash, cajote, chili peppers introduced from Mexico, okra and cowpeas from Africa, and filet powder, dried sassafras leaves from the Choctaw Indians. As in San Domingue, however, the foundation of the cuisine was constructed on fish and crustaceans. And of course, in Louisiana, that fish or crustacean becomes the crawfish. Geographically next door to Creole, Southern cooking developed among enslaved people, where Kimball rem reminds us that, quote, beef was rare and fresh milk even more so. Foods from Africa, like okra, yams, collard greens, cow peas, watermelons, commingled with molasses, cornbread, grits, chitterlings, fried fish, salt pork, fat pork, and occasionally ham. These dishes were also cooked with some modifications by slaves in the big house where they were accompanied by dishes that included roasted pig, turtle soup, steak, mutton, turkey, fried chicken, chicken and dumplings, and sherbet. And in places where rice was cultivated, such as the Carolinas, rice became incorporated as well. Kibble credits the Germans, rightly, for giving us bratwurst and beer. They also apparently gave us French toast, which was originally called German toast, um, but we stopped calling it that during the World Wars, and uh, we didn't go back. <laughs> um, but the, some German names remained, including the Frankfurter for hot dogs and Hamburger for Hamburg, Germany. Did I say? Uh, yeah, Hamburger. Germans liked pork, too, a lot, which is how sausage uh, uh, took root in Wisconsin and Illinois. Germans began dairy farming in the Midwest, where they tackled cheese and butter, adding Limburger and brick cheeses to the English cheese that had previously been available. And of course, the likes of dumplings, sauerkraut, schnitzel, sauerbraten, and rye, and pumpernickel breads were still other German specialties that were blended into cuisines originally introduced by the English. That had the effect of, quote, accelerating a Europeanizing of American cuisine. And yes, there was beer. I'm from the Midwest, having lived in both Minnesota and Wisconsin. <laughs> what I didn't realize until I read Kipple was that the early brewery towns depended on the Great Lakes and the Mississippi for a steady supply of ice and cool caves where they could ferment. Up to that point, beer had been top fermented with just about anything that could be coaxed to do it. Persimmons, pumpkins, maize, sugar, all things that were um, relatively indigenous, uh, with, the, with the exception of persimmon, I think. This, was, uh, this made for an ale that was heavy, dark, and cloudy. In fact, hard cider owed much of its foothold in the early American drinking economy to the fact that the ale was, simply put, pretty gross. The lager-style beer that was first produced in Milwaukee then and Chicago and St. Louis later was a welcome innovation and sparked the agricultural production of barley and hops nearer those centers. And English cooking methods didn't disappear in the face of these new techniques. Um, uh, one pot boiled meals were a hallmark of the English, as was an extravagant use of salt and a sweet tooth satisfied by maple syrup. I think we could still say we have an extravagant taste for salt and a sweet tooth as a country. Um, uh, codfish, too, were an overabundance in England, and they were being exported as early as 1640 in Massachusetts Bay, and so all New Englanders know that we rely on codfish and clam chowder and things like that, which were one-pot meals that combined the, the ingredients of the, of the locality. So these, food, these are the food trends that then lay 
the groundwork for our culinary cultures throughout the 17 and early 1700s and early and early 1800s. These were cooks and eaters and drinkers who were no longer fending for survival and narrowly evading starvation. Theirs were culinary cultures with expressed tastes. Yet American agriculture itself was still fledgling. We were trading a great deal and the founders were looking for more and varied crops to root the nascent nation. It was in this context that Thomas Jefferson articulated a notion that today may seem a bit overstated. Quote, the greatest service which can be rendered to any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. Jefferson was not alone in his opinion that biodiversity in agriculture especially was essential. Once established after the revolution, the government has, the government has played a significant role in finding and introducing new agricultural varieties ever since. As early as 1819, the Secretary of the Treasury requested the naval and consular officials in foreign countries send back, quote, whatever plants or seeds they might deem of value to American farmers. There was no additional funding for the project, so very few naval officers took up the charge, and those who did were not skilled in preserving seeds or transplants, so many of the shipments failed. There were, however, a handful of naval officers with some tangential interest who aided the collection of plant specimens. The first major effort by the Navy towards these ends was in 1838, and the year after the Patent Office more officially enlisted the military and, um, and allocated a modest financial support. So that by the middle of the 19th century, consuls and Navy officers were the ones who were involved in plant collecting. The plants brought back um, uh, were some the the plants that were brought back were sometimes collected and sometimes exchanged, but then they were distributed across the country to farmers, nascent botanical gardens, and other plant enthusiasts. And this was really essential to building our agricultural economy. We didn't yet have the infrastructure of university research stations and industry. So much of our history, plants and seeds have moved easily across borders and passed without issue from hand to hand. Um, and in the, in the 19th century in particular, we really relied on farmers to plant new and different varieties and report back to DC about how those things grew. Um, that was really important to, to testing and diversifying um, the, 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 the agricultural varieties that we had on hand. Recipients of these seeds were so enthused that soon congressmen eventually were sending them under their own seals to constituents um, as widely as possible. This, the goal, aside from political goodwill, was to scatter these seeds as widely as possible. Um, and then in 1877, we passed the Hatch Act, which um, initiated land grant institutions, research stations, which was a major investment that then hastened technical revolution in agricultural production after that. Um, a really interesting figure at this time is David Fairchild, who was an eager biologist, uh, an eager botanist, who then came to introduce over 200,000 exotic plants to the country. Um, he is among the most productive plant explorers, and he toured the globe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, looking for improvements in things like sugarcane and rice, um, seeking varieties of plants that had come under duress of disease and vermin. Um, but he was also just an, enthusiast an enthusiastic adventurer in search of rarities. Fairchild's the focus of a new book that was just released last year called The Food Explorer. He's per perhaps best known for his work bringing Japanese cherry trees to the United States and planting them in Washington, D.C. But he also brought us red seedless grapes, kale, hops from Bavaria, the Meyer lemon, mangoes, mangosteen, soybeans and avocados, dates, papayas, Egyptian cotton, and many others. Now, these plants had been circulating in some roots, to be sure, but Fairchild brought them intentionally to the United States and then used his role as manager of the Office of Seed and Plant Introduction at the USDA to help carve out a place for them in agriculture. The landscape in both ter in terms of food and flora were drastically altered and diversified by this group of people who called themselves the plant explorers. David Fairchild um, is chief among them. 
And at the same time, refrigeration and transportation, and even refrigerated transportation, made the foods of one place more easy to transport to any other place that was interested in them. And so it's at this point that the consumer market becomes a major driving factor in diversification. People were better able to express their enthusiasm for certain foods, shop at certain markets, and frequent certain of the few restaurants that were starting to open. And so as immigrants continued to come from new and varied places, they participated in this process, creating new communities of consumption. Often some of the first people to help establish food sources familiar to new immigrant groups were and still are immigrants themselves. And many of the products brought here by immigrants in the early 20th century are now central to our diets both for the specific ethnic niches that they were brought here to fill, but also for use across our foodscape. In the 19th century, a Norwegian immigrant to Texas wrote home, advising prospective immigrants to bring seeds. She particularly hankered for cabbage of any kind, cauliflower, kohlrabi, Swedish turnips, or French ones. She also sought trees from Norway, including empress, bergamot, gray pear, glass and pigeon apple trees, green and St. Catherine plum trees, and cherry trees, as well as goose and currant bushes. Japanese farmers brought with them Napa cabbage and radishes from home. From France, there were soft-shelled walnuts and prune plums. Italians in California cultivated prickly pear and broccoli. And Gabaccia quotes one immigrant's letter home. No one liked broccoli here for a long time. <laughs> and if my nine-year-old is the yardstick, they still don't. <laughs> Rice imports, too, soared as Chinese and Japanese immigrated to California. Around the, 20th around the turn of the century in California alone, there was new market for 35 million pounds of imported rice, coming mostly from China and supplemented from Hawaii. In this second wave of immigration, when Chinese, Japanese, and to some extent Koreans and later Filipinos arrived and settled on the West Coast, um, uh, immigrants from Asia also created market demand for familiar dishes from places like China and Canton in particular. Many of the immigrants um, who came here to work on railroads and the like um, had come alone, just like the narrator in Lahiri's story, and were not used to cooking for themselves. Many of them rented rooms that did not have kitchens, and so restaurants cropped up to feed them in places like Chinatown. Things that can't be grown but rather need to be made are often made by ethnic producers. Chinese restaurants accompanied by Jewish delis were among the earliest ethnic restaurants. At the turn of the century, people in Italian enclaves made pasta from scratch um, until World War I caused a, a shortage of a supply in Russian Durham wheat, and it facilitated a change of those pasta makers to using domestic wheat which then made the enterprise profitable. And by 1930, one of the earliest pasta companies, La Rosa, had 300 Italian workers and sales of three to five million per year. The same, a similar story can be told around importing kosher meats that proved difficult for Jews from Eastern Europe. And so came a rapid growth of kosher butcher shops, um, of which some estimate as high as 10,000 across the country the in the first decades of the 20th century, 9,000 of which were in New York alone. Gabaccia cites that by 1917, at the height of orthodoxy in America, a million Jews ate 156 million pounds of kosher meat each year. So ethnic entrepreneurs through grocery stores and restaurants provided a link between farmers and producers to consumers. And now we live in a world where we can buy most anything anytime. New immigrant communities give way to new market niches and new ethnic markets and new ethnic restaurants from which some foods spill over into mainstream markets. The food we eat today is no less immigrant than the people in the United States who eat it. But that's not the end of the story on plant genetic diversity and our foodscape. As our national agriculture matured, and as our food supplies became more stable and secure, laymen, by the way of military officers, farmers, and budding naturalists, were less and less necessary to the endeavor. Whereas during the early period of plant diversification, individual plant explorers and immigrants served important functions, once the agricultural base was set, there came a wave of more specialized diversification, much of which was, taking was increasingly taking place in the laboratory. 
scientific developments and new bureaucracies, including land-grant universities, began focusing on plant breeding and seed research. And the fledgling seed industry was developing clout at the time as well. Indeed, in 1883, seed firms joined together to establish the American Seed, uh, the American seed Trade Association, an organization that would, at the turn of the century, pressure Congress and the USDA to stop giving away seeds. They pressured them to cease their popular seed distribution program because it was bad for free trade. So this confluence of factors, an increasingly established agriculture, scientific progress, and industry lobbying, each played a role in the struggles to patent plant life, which also began in the early 20th century. In 1930, the Plant Protection Act made possible the patenting of asexually reproduced plants, like fruit trees. In 1970, the Plant Variety Protection Act increased the patentability of plants, and in 1985, full range of plant genetic material, including sexually reproduced seeds, became wholly patentable. Along with patentability came the potential to profit, as we've seen over the last decades, um, a significant investment in seed research by private industry, as well as a consolidation of those industries into the hands of just a few companies. Whereas plant diversification and genetic diversity were once projects of national import, projects that settlers, citizens, and immigrants all engaged in together with the government, today it's defined in increasingly narrow terms. Most of us probably don't consider adding a useful plant to our culture. We're just concerned with consuming the useful plants that are here. And the companies that now engineer the seeds that our farmers use aren't terribly concerned with diversifying agriculture either. Their bottom line is more preoccupied with getting more people to buy the handful of seed varieties that they hold under patent. As the number of farmers has decreased and our population has increasingly moved um, in large numbers from rural locations to cities, many fewer people have engaged in projects of the land. Biodiversity and plant propagation used to be a shared project that's now been delegated to science. So it's that in these last 30 years that we've lived in a country with fully legalized restrictions on the production and distribution of certain seeds, and, the push and pushback has been significant from grassroots organizations, some farmers and seed savers, as well as international organizations like member nations of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Corporate interests, though, are significant, and seed companies are shrewdly protecting their new rights. Monsanto is perhaps the most notorious. Um, their litigious pursuits against small farmers have been highlighted by the likes of Barbara Kingsolver in her hugely successful Animal Vegetable Miracle and documentaries like Food Inc. and The World According to Monsanto. Though the finite details of plant-related patent law may not have been readily apparent to the public in the 1980s, increased attention to, industrial, um, to the industrial food system has cultivated a pool of concerned consumers, some of whom have at least a vague sense of the stakes of plant-related patents and seed-saving practices. My new project is on seeds and the people who save them. I'm particularly interested in what compels them to do so. Seeds are ubiquitous. We eat them, we plant them, we blow them in the wind. They're so common that they're easily taken for granted when in fact they're natural marvels. Despite massive diversity in size, shape, color, and potential, each seed contains within it the information to grow an entire plant. Sometimes that plant is a sequoia and sometimes it's a crocus. The seed side is hardly predictive of its outcome, a sequoia seed being infinitesimally smaller than an avocado. Yet encased in a seed shell is the full capacity of nature. Science renders a, a seed's potential more visible, for now we know that inside a seed shell is all the genetic information to grow a new living, breathing, eating organism that shares the characteristics of its genus, but also in some ways new and never before known to the world. Possibly it's even better adapted to survive than either of its parents. And as fascinating and sundry as seeds are, so too are the people who save them. Seeds are saved by backyard gardeners who grow rare heritage tomatoes, by immigrants reconstructing far removed pallets of home, by indigenous peoples preserving living histories and sacred resources, by farmers trying to reduce outputs or gain a competitive edge with a niche crop, 
communities bolstering native flora, seed companies hunting for the next bestseller, community seed banks facilitating um, and inspiring gardening, international organizations, global seed banks, um, and networks of people connected to practices of food sovereignty. Seeds are saved in developed nations and developing nations, and the practice of seed saving represents both old world skills and cutting edge science. And yet, ubiquitous and common, seed saving is also urgent and embattled. Corporate advantage in plant breeding, production, and sales, along with numerous other factors, has led to a national agriculture of monocropping. What feels like massive diversity at the store is often, and often is, really only scratches the surface of the Earth's botanical bounty. A supermarket may carry 10 varieties of tomatoes, which is suffice to cover our grocery shopping list. But there are 3,000 varieties of tomatoes in active cultivation around the world and 15,000 that we know about. Apples are an interesting example here, too. Even though we've miraculously broken the reign of the red delicious, and supermarkets now carry a dessert array of varieties, sometimes 20 or more. Though there are just 100 apple varieties in commercial production in the U.S. out of 2,500 that are grown here and 7,500 that are grown around the world. Our food system craves uniformity. The full spectrum of plant genetic diversity in agriculture is unable to compute. <coughs> we're in a position now where we're losing diversity, biodiversity at a pace unknown. Virginia Nazaria cites that, quote, in terms of crop genetic diversity, the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates a rate of disappearance of 1 to 2 percent per annum, from which the Rural Advancement Foundation International infers that we may already have lost close to 75 percent of agricultural biodiversity. In short, Nazaria continues, there's a growing consensus that biodiversity loss is accelerating and irreversible, its consequences unfortunately dire. With this data, and the consolidation of plant genetic diversity of seeds into the hands of fewer and fewer corporations, it seems to me that the stakes of seed saving are quite high. The good news is that our history is as an immigrant people who eat immigrant foods from all over the world, and much of our history in this land has been spent searching for difference and cultivating diversity that can both sustain and enrich our lives. The practice of seed saving itself the selecting and procuring and drying and saving may be the same for many heirloom practitioners as it was for our forefathers, but the stakes and the context are no less urgent. <laughs>